story of the other wise man. So normally when I come up here, I have a big stack of notes that I'm going to talk through, and you're all looking at that, trying to gauge how long is he going to talk, you know. And uh, I fooled you, fooled you today. I got uh, instead just one little book, and I'm going to read you a book today. But uh, it's a little different. It's a short story by a man named Henry Van Dyke. And uh, I'm not going to read the entire book to you. I just want to read bits and pieces of it to you. And hopefully you'll get the story from it, because I think it's worth sharing. It's a story about seeking God. It's a story about a man who uh, just wanted to worship Jesus. He read and read the scriptures that he had available to him in this story. Uh, And he just wanted to go worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And just because, just because he is worthy to be worshipped. And I would encourage you to look at the uh, piece that Stephen put in the bulletin today. It, It expresses that sentiment exactly, very well. He always does a good job picking that up just from a sermon title. He seems to be able to catch the drift of it. But that's what the story is about. And he plans to go with his friends, the Magi that uh, Bobby read about there in Matthew chapter 2. But uh, as things work out, he doesn't get to. But he he wants to go and do a, a like thing that they do. He wants to present gifts to Jesus. And he spends his entire life searching for him. And we'll read about it as we go. But like life usually happens, it doesn't unfold the way he planned. And that's really the story of our lives. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about the big things we're going to do. We make all these plans, but our lives are really about what happens while we're making all those plans, aren't they? And that's the story that we get here. And it's all about worshiping God, not with the big things that we plan to do with our lives, but with the little things that happen in our lives and the way we treat others around us as I hope you'll see. So I want to get right in there, and and I included what I did do, the same as I always do, I included a lot of scripture. And uh, I don't apologize for that, because everything we know about God comes from those scriptures. And I guess I see us, just as an aside from from the lesson, I see us as like the story of those five blind men that come across the elephant, you know? Spiritually speaking, we're just like that. We're totally blind. And they, they seek to understand the object that's in front of them by, by using their sense of touch and paint a mental picture for themselves of what they got there. And each one of them does a good job, but he only sees a small portion of the elephant. So one thinks it's a rope, one thinks it's a big expansive wall by his midsection, and another thinks it's a trunk of a tree by his big legs. And each one's accurate, but it's not the whole picture. And that's what it's like for us. If we want to see the true nature of God and who he really is, we got to get in that word. So in short, if you want to touch the face of God, start touching the pages of your Bible because that's where you'll find him. And that's what I wanted to do here is put up some scriptures that I think goes along with the story. It uh, helps set the backdrop for what uh, Mr. Van Dyke was talking about. And just just a couple of sentences about him. Henry Van Dyke, he lived from 1852 to 1933. And he was an American author, educator, and clergyman. Attended Princeton University, then served as pastor of of the Brick Presbyterian Church in New York City. He returned to Princeton as a professor of English English literature and uh, served there for a number of years. And then he held various distinguished positions in, in American life. He was an ambassador to the Netherlands and Luxembourg, a moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, commander of the Legion of Honor, and president of the National Institute of Arts and Letters. So he's a very educated guy, and as, you, as we read through the story, you're going to see that he's also very knowledgeable of the scriptures. So I just wanted to break right into it uh, and start reading you, and I, like I said, I'm just going to try to give you kind of the Reader's Digest version of the, of the whole story. So I'm going to read bits and pieces of it. Uh, a lot of the story is is uh, Mr. Van Dyke using literary terms to construct a picture for you. And uh, I wanted to read just for you the, the nuggets that I think are so relevant to, to our lives. As, we, as, we, as Jerry mentioned, as we come to the new year, we're often taking stock of what's happened this past year, and we're also looking forward to the next one. We're always asking ourselves, are we headed down the right path? Is there something we need to do different this year? And I hope this story can help clarify what it 
what it means to be a seeker of God. So in the days when Augustus Caesar was master of many kings and Herod reigned in Jerusalem, there lived in the city of Ecbatana among the mountains of Persia a certain man named Artaban, the Median. And it goes on to tell about his house where he lives here in this city in Persia. And he invites some guests over, and he wants to have a a meeting with some friends of his. It says, he stood in the doorway to greet his guests, a tall, dark man of about 40 years, with brilliant eyes set near together under his broad brow, and firm lines graven around his fine, thin lips, the brow of a dreamer, and the mouth of a soldier, a man of sensitive feeling but inflexible will, one of those who, in whatever age they may live, are born for inward conflict and a life of quest. His robe was of pure white wool thrown over a tunic of silk and a white pointed cap with long lapels at the sides rested on his flowing black hair. It was the dress of the ancient priesthood of the Magi called the fire worshipers. Skipping down, Artaban addresses his friends. You have come tonight, he said, looking around the circle at my call as the faithful scholars of Zoroaster to renew your worship and rekindle your faith in the God of purity. Even as this fire has been rekindled on the altar, we worship not the fire, but him of whom it is chosen symbol. Because it is the purest of all created things, it speaks to us of one who is light and truth. Is it not so, my father? And he's talking to his, uh, a mentor, a friend of his. Oops, I got to turn this on. Sorry who's been uh, a teacher of his. It is well said, my son, answered the venerable Agrabus. The enlightened are never idolaters. They lift the veil of the form and go into the shrine of reality. And new light and truth are come to them continually through the old symbols. Hear me my, then, my father, and my friends, said Artaban very quietly, while I tell you of the new light and truth that have come to me through the most ancient of all signs. And he goes on to describe their practice of the Magi of studying the stars in the heavens. And he gets a pushback from one of his friends, one of the guests that he invited, named Tigranes. The stars, said Tigranes, are the thoughts of the eternal. They are numberless. But the thoughts of man can be counted like the years of his life. The wisdom of the Magi is the greatest of all wisdoms on earth because it knows its own ignorance. And that is the secret of power. We keep men always looking and waiting for a new sunrise, but we ourselves know that the darkness is equal to the light and that the conflict between them, between them will never be ended. That does not satisfy me, answered Artaban. For if the waiting must be endless, if there could be no fulfillment of it, then it would be, not be wisdom to look and wait. We should become like those new teachers of the Greeks who say that there is no truth. And that the only wise men are those who spend their lives in discovering and exposing the lies that have been believed in the world. But the new sunrise will certainly dawn in the appointed time. Do not our own books tell us that this will come to pass and that men will see the brightness of a great light. So you see this concept of folks out there that want to call the Bible a myth and a a, a non-truth, of course, is nothing new. Sometimes we think of that as being a modern thing, but here in the late 19th century, Van Dyke is dealing with that same problem. And so, Agrabus, his friend, speaks up, and he says, In that day, uh, the victorious shall arise out of the number of the prophets in the east country. Around him shall shine a mighty brightness, and it shall make life everlasting, incorruptible, and immortal, and the dead shall rise again. This is a dark saying, said Tigranes, and it may be that we shall never understand it. It is better to consider the things that are near at hand and to increase the influence of the Magi in their own country rather than to look for one who may be a stranger and to whom we must resign our power. So you see a touch in Tigranes of that, of that uh, pharisaical attitude, wanting to hold on to power through knowledge and wisdom. And I hope we don't do that ourselves in our knowledge of the scriptures. We don't hang on to it as a way of feeling some pride or sense of accomplishment in ourselves. And so Artaban argues back. He says, My father to Agrabus, I have kept this prophecy in the secret place of my soul. Religion without a great hope would be like an altar without a living fire. And now the flame has burned more brightly. 
And by the light of it, I have read other words which also have come to the fountain of truth and speak yet more clearly of the rising of the victorious one and his brightness. And so Artaban begins to produce for them a couple of scrolls that he's got in his, in his tunic. And he says, hear the words of this prophecy. There shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And he begins to talk also of the prophet Daniel. A prophet of sure things and a reader of the thoughts of God, Daniel proved himself to our people. And these are the words that he wrote. Artaban read from the second scroll. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore Jerusalem unto the anointed one, the prince, the time shall be seven and three score and two weeks. And so they begin to argue that how can you understand what that means? How can we know what that's forecasting? Artaban answered, It has been shown to me and to my three companions among the Magi, Caspar, Melkar, and Balthasar. We have searched the ancient tablets of Chaldea and computed the time. It falls in this year. We have studied the sky, and in the spring of the year we saw two of the greatest stars drawn near together in the sign of the fish, which is the house of the Hebrews. We also saw a new star there which shone for one night and then vanished. Now again the two great planets are meeting. This night is their conjunction. My three brothers are watching at the ancient temple of the seven spheres in Borsippa in Babylonia. And I am watching here. If the, sh- if the star shines again, they will wait ten days for me at the temple. And then we'll set out together for Jerusalem to see and worship the promised one who shall be born king of Israel. I believe the sign will come. I have made ready for the journey. I have sold my house and my possessions and bought these three jewels, and a sapphire, a ruby, and a pearl to carry them as a tribute to the king. I ask you to go with me on the pilgrimage that we may have joy together in finding the prince who is worthy to be served. And so around the room there's some discussion and some disagreement. Finally, Tigranes speaks up, the one who's been arguing with him the whole time. Artaban, this is a vain dream. It comes from too much looking upon the stars and the cherishing of lofty thoughts. It would be wiser to spend time in gathering money for the new fire temple at Kala. No king will ever rise from the broken race of Israel, and no end will ever come to the eternal strife of life, light and darkness. He who looks for it is a chaser of shadows. Farewell. And his friends begin to leave the room. But Argabus his, his mentor, the oldest one who loved Artaban the best, lingered after the others had gone and said gravely, My son, it may be that the light of truth is in the sign that has appeared in the skies, and it will surely lead to the prince and the mighty brightness. Or it may be that it is only a shadow of the light, as Tigranes has said. And then he who follows it will only have a long pilgrimage and an empty search. But it is better to follow even the shadow of the best than to remain content with the worst. And those who see wonderful things must often be ready to travel alone. So Artaban now has to set out alone. He couldn't convince any of his comrades to go with him. And the rest of the story tells it kind of in a second-person nature. And Van Dyke talks about the travels of Artaban as he goes to join his friends and seek out the king. And so he leaves on a horse named Vazda, and it's his most trusted horse, who's ready to go at a moment's notice. And the two of them ride off into the night. And uh, it says here that Artaban must indeed ride wisely and well if he would keep the appointed hour with the other magi. For the route was 150 parsangs, and 15 was the utmost that he could travel in a day. But he knew Vazda's strength and pushed forward without anxiety, making the fixed distance every day, though it, he must travel late into the night and long before the sunrise. As he's going across the desert, he comes to a a grove of date palms. And I wanted to read to you his first interaction here as he's on on this journey to find the king. A grove of date palms made an island of gloom in the pale yellow sea. As he passed into the shadow, Vazda slackened her pace and began to pick her way more carefully. Near the farther end of the darkness, an access of caution seemed to fall upon her. She scented some danger or difficulty, and it was not in her heart to fly from it, only to be prepared for it, to meet it wisely as a good horse should do, 
The grove was close and silent as a tomb. Not a leaf rustled, not a bird sang. She felt her steps before her delicately, carrying her head low and sighing now, and then with apprehension. At last, she gave a quick breath of anxiety and dismay and stood stock still, quivering in every muscle before a dark object in the shadow of the last palm tree. Artaban dismounted. The dim starlight revealed the form of a man lying across the road, his humble dress and the outline of his haggard face show that he was probably one of the poor Hebrew exiles who still dwelt in great numbers in the vicinity. His pallid skin, dry and yellow as parchment, before the mark of the deadly fever which ravaged the marshlands in the autumn. The chill of death was in his lean hand, and as Artaban released it, the arm fell back inertly upon the motionless breast. How could he stay here in the darkness to minister to a dying stranger? What claim had this unknown fragment of human life upon his compassion or service? If he lingered but for an hour, he could hardly reach Borsippa at the appointed time. His companions would think that he had given up the journey. They would go on without him. He would lose his quest. But if he went on now, the man would surely die. If he stayed, life might be restored. His spirit throbbed and fluttered with urgency of the crisis. Should he risk the great reward of his divine faith for the sake of a single deed of human love? Should he turn aside, if only for a moment, from following the star to give a cup of cold water to a poor, perishing Hebrew? God of truth and purity, he prayed, direct me in the holy path, the way of wisdom which thou only knowest. Then he turned back to the sick man. Hour after hour he labored as only a skillful healer of disease can do, and at last the man's strength returned. He sat up and looked upon, about him. Who art thou, he said in a rude dialect of the country, and why hast thou sought me here to bring back my life? I am Artaban the Magian of the city of Ecbatana, and I'm going to Jerusalem in search of one who is to be born king of the Jews, a great prince and deliverer of all men. I dare not delay any longer upon my journey for the caravan that has awaited me may depart without me. But see, here is all that I have left of bread and wine, and here is a portion of healing herbs. When thy strength is restored, thou can find the dwelling of the Hebrews among the houses of Babylon. The Jew raised his trembling hand solemnly to heaven. Now may the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob bless and prosper the journey of the merciful and bring him to peace to his desired haven. But stay, I have nothing to give you in return, only this, that I can tell thee where the Messiah must be sought. For our prophets have said that he should be born in, not in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem of Judah. May the Lord bring thee in safety to that place, because thou hast had pity upon the sick. Well, Artaban sees that this fellow is going to get better, that he's going to do well, and so he remounts his horse and takes off on Vazda and heads towards the temple. But when he gets there, he finds it's abandoned. And at the edge of the terrace there on the temple, he sees under a pile of bricks a little piece of parchment or paper, and it's a note from his friend. He picks it up and he reads it and says, We have waited past midnight and can de delay no longer. We go to find the king. Follow us across the desert. Artaban sat down upon the ground and covered his head in despair. How can I cross the desert, he said, with no food and with a spent horse? I must return to Babylon, sell my sapphire, and buy a train of camels and provision for the journey. I may never, never overtake my friends. Only God, the merciful, knows whether I, should, uh, whether I shall not lose sight of the king because I tarried to show mercy. And so he's down one of his gifts now. He only has two left in his plans. And as we go on this story... We see Artaban traveling across the desert through all the heat and through all the cold nights and through all the loneliness. He, he ventures on and he follows that star. And eventually he arrives at, at Bethlehem by the direction of the, of the Hebrew that he helped. And it was the third day after the three wise men had come to that place and had found Mary and Joseph with the young child Jesus and had lain their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh at his feet. And so he finds that the streets of the village seemed to be deserted, and Artaban wondered whether the men had all gone up to the hill pastures to bring down their sheep. 
From the open door of a low, a low stone cottage, he heard the sound of a woman's voice singing softly. He entered and found a young mother hushing her baby to rest. She told him of the strangers from the Far East who had appeared in the village three days ago and how they, had, how they said they had a star had guided them to the place where Joseph of Nazareth was lodging with his wife and her newborn child and how they paid reverence to the child and given him many rich gifts. But the travelers disappeared, she continued, as suddenly as they had come. We were afraid of the strangeness of their visit. We could not understand it. The man of Nazareth took the babe and his mother and fled away that same night secretly. And it was whispered that they, they were going far away to Egypt. Ever since, there's been a spell upon the village. Something evil hangs over it. They say that the Roman soldiers are coming from Jerusalem to force a new tax from us. And the men have driven the flocks and the herds far back among the hills and hid themselves to escape it. Well, it goes on to describe how he stays there with the young mom, and, and she's going to um, offer him some food. So she puts the baby down to, to sleep in its cradle, and she begins to prepare a meal for him. But suddenly there comes a noise of wild confusion and uproar in the streets of the village, a shrieking and wailing of women's voices, a clangor of brazen trumpets, and a clashing of swords, and a desperate cry. The soldiers, the soldiers of Herod, they're killing our children. The young mother's face grew white with terror. She clasped her child to her bosom and crouched motionless in the darkest corner of the room, covering him with the folds of her robe, lest she should wake and cry. But Artaban went quickly and stood in the doorway of the house. His broad shoulders filled the portal from side to side. The peak of his white cap all but touched the lintel. The soldiers came hurrying down the street with bloody hands and dripping swords. At the sight of the stranger... And his, in his imposing dress, they hesitated with surprise. The captain of the band approached the threshold to thrust them aside, but Artaban did not stir. His face was as calm as though he were watching the stars, and his eyes there burned that steady radiance before which even a half-tamed hunting leopard shrinks, and the fierce bloodhound pauses in his leap. He held the, sh- the soldier silently for an instant, and then said in a low voice, I'm all alone in this place, and I'm waiting to give this jewel to the prudent captain who will leave me in peace. He showed the ruby glistening in the hollow of his hand like a great drop of blood. The captain was amazed at the splendor of the gem. The pupils of his eyes expanded with desire, and the hard lines of greed wrinkled around his lips. He stretched out his hand and took the ruby. March on, he cried to his men. There's no child here. The house is still. The, clangor, the clamor and clang of arms pass down the street as the headlong fury of chase sweeps the secret covert where trembling deer is hidden. Artaban re-entered the cottage, turned his face to the east and prayed, God of truth, forgive my sin. I've said the thing that is not to save the life of a child. The two of my gifts are gone. I've spent for man that which was meant for God. Shall I ever be worthy to see the face of the king? But the voice of the woman, weeping for joy in the shadow behind him, said very gently, Because thou hast saved the life of my little one, may the Lord bless and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And so we read on about Artaban as he leaves there and he he continues to wander. And now he heads to Egypt and he he wanders all around trying to find... um, the family, trying to chase down Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus, the young man. And as he he enters uh, an obscure house in Alexandria, he he finds the counsel of a Hebrew rabbi there. And we read here the venerable man bending over rolls of parchment on which the prophecies of Israel are written, read aloud the pathetic words which foretold the sufferings of the promised Messiah, the despised and rejected of men, the man of sorrows, and the acquaintance of grief. And remember, my son, he said, fixing his deep-set eyes upon the face of Artaban, the king whom you are seeking is not to be found in a palace, nor among the rich and powerful. If the light of the world and the glory of Israel had been appointed to come with the greatness of earthly splendor, it must have appeared long ago, for no son of Abraham will ever again rival the power of Joseph had in the palaces of Egypt, or the magnificence of Solomon, Thrown between the lions in Jerusalem. 
But the light for which the world is waiting is a new light, the glory that shall rise out of patient and triumphant suffering. And the kingdom which is to be established forever is a new kingdom, the royalty of perfect and unconquerable love. I do not know how this shall come to pass, nor how the turbulent kings and peoples of earth shall be brought to acknowledge the Messiah and pay homage to him. But this I know, those who seek him will do well to look among the poor and lowly and the sorrowful and the oppressed. So I saw the other wise man again and again, traveling from place to place and searching among the people of dispersion with whom the little family from Bethlehem might perhaps have found refuge. He passed through countries where famine lay heavy upon the land and where poor were crying for bread. He made his dwelling in plague-stricken streets where the sick were languishing in bitter companionship of helpless misery. He visited the oppressed and the afflicted in the gloom of subterranean prisons and crowded wretchedness of slave markets and the weary toil of galley ships. In all this populous and intricate world of anguish, though he found none to worship, he found many to help. He fed the hungry and clothed the naked and healed the sick and comforted the captive. And his years went by more swiftly than a weaver's shuttle that flashes back and forth through the loom while the web grows and the invisible pattern is completed. And so we come to the last chapter of Artaban's life. And Van Dyke uh, titles that one, The Pearl of Great Price. Remember, he's down to just one more gift to offer the King of Kings. So I want to read you here in closing the way he winds up worshiping his king. Three and thirty years of the life of Artaban had passed away, and he was still a pilgrim and a seeker after light. His hair, once darker than the cliffs of Zagros, and now white as the wintry snow that covered them, His eyes that once flashed like flames of fire were dull as embers, smoldering among the ashes. Worn and weary and ready to die, but still looking for the king, he had come for the last time to Jerusalem. He had often visited the holy city before and had searched through all its lanes and crowded hovels and black prisons without finding any trace of the family of Nazarenes who had fled from Bethlehem long ago. But now it seemed as if he must make one more effort And something whispered in his heart that, at last, he might succeed. It was the season of Passover. The city was thronged with strangers. The children of Israel, scattered in far lands all over the world, had returned to the temple for the great feast. And there had been a confusion of tongues in the narrow streets for many days. But on this day, there was a singular agitation visible in the multitude. The sky was veiled with a pretentious gloom, and currents of excitement seemed to flash through the crowd like the thrill which shakes the forest on the eve of a storm. A secret tide was sweeping them all one way. The clatter of sandals and the soft, thick sound of thousands of bare feet shuffling over the stones flowed unceasingly along the streets that lead to the Damascus Gate. Artaban joined the company with a group of people from his own country, Parthian Jews who had come up to keep the Passover and inquired of them the cause of the tumult and where they were going. We are going, they answered, to the place called Golgotha, outside the city walls, where there is to be an execution. Have you not heard what has happened? Two famous robbers are to be crucified, and with them another called Jesus of Nazareth, a man who has done many wonderful works among the people, so that they love him greatly. But the priests and elders have said that he must die, because he gave himself out to be the Son of God. And Pilate has sent him to the cross, because he said that he was king of the Jews." How strangely these familiar words fell upon the tired heart of Artaban. They had led him for a lifetime over land and sea, and now they came to him darkly and mysteriously like a message of despair. The king had arisen, but he had been denied and cast out. He was about to perish. Perhaps he was already dying. Could it be the same who had been born in Bethlehem 33 years ago, at whose birth the star had appeared in heaven, and of whose coming the prophets had spoken? Artaban's heart beat unsteadily with that troubled, doubtful apprehension, which is the excitement of old age. But he said within himself, the ways of God are stranger than the thoughts of men. And it may be that I shall find the king at last in the hands of his enemies and shall come in time to offer my pearl for his ransom before he dies. So the old man 
followed the multitude with slow and painful steps toward the Damascus gate of the city. Just beyond the entrance of the guardhouse, a troop of Macedonian soldiers came down the street, dragging a young girl with a torn dress and disheveled hair. As the Magian paused to look at her with compassion, she broke suddenly from the hands of her tormentors and threw herself at his feet, clasping him around the knees. She had seen his white cap and the winged circle on his breast. Have pity on me, she cried, and save me for the sake of the God of purity. I am also a daughter of the true religion which is taught by the Magi. My father was a merchant of Parthia, but he is dead, and I am seized for his debts to be sold as a slave. Save me from worse than death. Ardavan trembled. It was the old conflict in his soul, which had come to him in the palm grove of Babylon and in the cottage at Bethlehem. The conflict between the expectation of faith and the impulse of love. Twice the gift which he had consecrated to worship, to the worship of religion, had been drawn from his hand to the service of humanity. This was the third trial, the ultimate probation, the final and irrevocable choice. Was it his great opportunity or his last temptation? He could not tell. Only one thing was clear in the darkness of his mind. It was an inevitable. And does not the inevitable come from God? One thing only was true to his divided heart. To rescue this helpless girl would be a true deed of love. And this is not, is not love the light of the soul? He took the pearl from his bosom. Never had it seemed so luminous, so radiant, so full of tender, living luster. He laid it in the hand of the slave. This is thy ransom, daughter. It is the last of my treasures which I kept for the king. While he spoke... The darkness of the sky thickened and shuddering tremors ran through the earth, heaving convulsively like the breast of one who struggles with mighty grief. The walls of the houses rocked to and fro. Stones were loosened and crashed into the street. Dust clouds filled the air. The soldiers fled in terror, reeling like drunken men. But Artaban and the girl whom he had ransomed crouched helpless beneath the wall of the praetorium. What had he to fear? What had he to live for? He had given away the last remnant of his tribute for the king. He had parted with the last hope of finding him. The quest was over. It had failed. But even in that thought, accepted and embraced, there was a peace. It was not a resignation. It was not a submission. It was something more profound and searching. He knew that all was well because he had done the best he could do from day to day. He had been true to the light and had given, been given to him. He had looked for more. If he had not found it, if a failure was all that came out of his life, doubtless that was the best that was possible. He had not seen the revelation of life everlasting, incorruptible and immortal, but he knew that even if he could live his life, earthly life over again, it could not otherwise have been what it had been. One more lingering pulsation of earthquake quivered through the ground. A heavy tile shaken from the roof fell and struck the old man on the temple. He lay breathless and pale, his gray head resting on the young girl's shoulder and blood trickling from the wound. As she bent over him, fearing that he was dead, there came a voice through the twilight, very small and still, like music from a, sounding from a distance, in which the notes are clear, but the words are lost. The girl turned to see if someone had spoken from the window above them, but she saw no one. Then the old man's lips began to move as if in answer. And she heard him say in the Parthian tongue, Not so, my lord, for when saw I thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw I thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? When saw I thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? Three and thirty years have I looked for thee, but I have never seen thy face, nor ministered to thee, my king. He ceased, and a sweet voice came again. And again the maid heard it, very faintly and far away, but now it seemed as though she understood the words. Verily I say unto thee, inasmuch as thou hast done it unto the least of these, my brethren, thou hast done it unto me. A calm radiance of wonder and joy lighted the pale face of Artaban, like the first ray of dawn on a snowy mountain peak. One long last breath of relief exhaled gently from his lips, 
His journey was ended. His treasures were accepted. The other wise men had found the king. So that's my story this morning that I wanted to share with you all. As we reflect on the new year and think about where we might head, where we might go with ourselves as a church, as individuals in our daily lives. Think about those thoughts that Mr. Van Dyke gave us so long ago in this this little story. And I hope it touches your heart and maybe inspires you to, to focus on the small things, the little things that really matter the most to God. So if you have any questions this morning, you have any prayer needs, maybe you want to know more about that King of Kings, anything at all, anything that you want answered this morning, I hope you'll bring it to us as we now stand and sing. Tim.